Welcome, everyone. We're so glad you can join us for this on-demand first quarter economic report and 2021 Outlook webinar hosted by JFL Total Wealth Management. The first quarter of 2021, which included President Biden's first 100 days, witnessed the continued uptick of the stock market and the resurgence of the U.S. economy as vaccinations became more widespread. Today, JFL will review the first quarter economic results in more detail and how the current recovery compares historically. We'll also discuss the infrastructure proposals that President Biden unveiled in April and how his proposed tax code changes, which are needed to fund many of the programs, can affect you. Without further ado, let's introduce our two panelists for today. Jeannie Kane has an MBA from Duke University and is a certified financial planner. She has extensive experience with analyzing and managing our private clients' portfolios and with developing comprehensive financial plans. Jerry Lynch is a certified financial planner and has been an independent financial advisor for 24 years, working in the financial industry for more than 30. Welcome. Welcome. Thanks. Why don't we get start started, Jerry? Can you... I can. I can and I will. Um, hello, everybody. I just want to go through a couple things today. I want to take some time and just kind of give an up, uh, investor update, what's happened over the first quarter, and then basically with some of the proposals that are out there, some of the things that we should be thinking about now, um, just to kind of give you a heads up on what's happening with Biden's program so that if there are any changes, you've already had a chance to kind of think about that and work out some ideas. Okay, when we talk about financial planning, we're going to look at five different things. Number one, we talk about insurance planning. You got to be able to protect everything that you have, whether it's home, auto, long-term care, life insurance, etc. The second thing is all of us at some point want to have the ability to retire and, and walk away on our own terms. We like to focus on that. Taxes are a critical part of anybody's long-term plan. The more that you pay in taxes, the less you have to save. So we're going to take a look at that. Estate planning, death and taxes are two stables in life. At some point, we're going to have to pass this on. We want to make sure it goes to the heirs in the ways that you want to. And we also are going to go through some investment ideas in terms of what, what should we be doing now and how to make the best out of this current situation. All right, so let's start with an investor update. All right, 2021 overview so far. We're going to take a look at a couple different things. A macro view. Basically, the global economy is continuing, uh, which kind of makes sense as the the uh, the vaccine gets out there and more and more people are getting back to work. We're also going to take a look at what's happening in the asset market with stocks and so forth. Basically, smaller companies, riskier stocks have a tendency to do incredibly well coming out of these types of things. So a couple things on the big picture look, major companies are recovering, which makes sense. They've, they've shut down businesses for a period of time. People are starting to get back to work as they receive vacuums, vaccines and so forth. So we're going to see a surge kind of coming out of here. The U.S. is in a mid-cycle of economic phase, basically means that we're kicking in right now. We've had people over the past year who have not had the ability to spend money. They want to spend money now. They want to go on vacation. They want to see their grandkids. They want to spend money. And their businesses are gearing up to provide those services. Uh, there's a big reaction to China's strong economy, and we're curious to see how that's going to kind of play out. And one of the things that we're concerned about is potential inflation. As, as more and more spending goes out there, it has a tendency to make things more expensive. If you take a look just, for example, at the lumber market, prices of lumber on new homes uh, have doubled in the past year. So if you're building a new home, it's probably going to cost you another thirty to $50,000 more just in lumber alone. On the asset side, there's a couple of things. Uh, again, the impact of interest rates are going to have an impact on the stock markets. If, if interest rates are at near zero, it forces people into the stock market to take risk because they need to get some level of gain on their money. Um, asset valuations reflect built into the asset prices. We're also taking a look at potential market volatility that's out there. If there's a surge of the virus in certain areas, again, some businesses are not going to be able to uh, scale up as fast as they want to. So you're definitely going to see some volatility that's out there. And I think the key here is how diversified is your portfolio. So right now, what's worked very well are small company stocks. Last year, what worked very well were large company stocks. One of the things you have to do is make sure that you rebalance and you diversify because you don't know what area is going to be hot over the next year. 
Now, when you take a look at what's happened over the past, really, 12 months, maybe even a little bit more, you know, we had in February, S&P closed at an all-time high, and then it fell like a rock. We had a 30-day period of time, or maybe a little bit more than that, that you saw a 33% drop in the stock market over a very short period of time. And then it just hit the floor and bounced up. By August, we had another all-time high. Uh, if you take a look at right now in April, or even really in May, uh, you're seeing all-time highs as well. Now, a lot of people ask me, are you afraid that market's at all-time highs? And my response is no. Historically, the market has all-time highs every year. It's just what the stock market does. It grows over a period of time. Yes, there will be declines in the market, but I feel very comfortable over a period of time, the market will continue to have all-time highs as we go forward. So again, if we take a look at what happened in 2021, you're seeing that smaller company stocks have done incredibly well, which kind of makes sense. Coming out of these type of economic downturns, smaller companies have a tendency to be able to grow faster than some of the larger companies. In a, in a volatile market like we saw last year, larger companies have a tendency to do better because they're more stable, they have better cash flow. But what we see here is that the areas of the market that did incredibly well were some of the small, small areas, uh, small values, small cap growth. All right. Now, if you take a look at this is bonds and it looks like it's a heart monitor, but you see that since basically you have January of 2009, interest rates have been very, very close to zero. Um, at the end of 2000 or beginning of 2016, they started to come back up. But once this crisis hit, basically, they went down to very low. So right now, I think the 10 year bond is at about 1.61 percent as we're kind of talking about this. And there's good things and bad things about this. The good thing about this is if you're buying a home, mortgage rates are incredibly low. And then you're seeing a surge in real estate for a variety of different reasons. One, th one part of that is that there are very low interest rates. However, if you're a retiree and your goal was to buy a 5% CD and you know get 5% interest and never touch the principal, the interest rates being this low force you either back into the stock market or it forces you to eat your principal. So that's what we're seeing out there. Now also, one of the questions that people always have is that, all right, how long will it take to double my money. I have no problem with money market accounts. I have no problem with CDs, as long as it's done in proportion. If we take a look at what were the interest rates over the past year, and I'm gonna start at the bottom and work my way up. 12 month CD last year was about a little bit less than half a percentage point. This, this week, it's 0.18%. At that rate, it takes 400 years for you to double your money. If I have money in a bank account and a money market account, last year the rate was average with about 0.16%. Now it's 0.07%. This means it would take 12,200 and I'm sorry, 12,028 years for you to double your money. And if you have a brokerage account, which just basically does 7.2%, and that's a very reasonable number for long-term growth in the stock market, that means every 10 years you double your money. If you need money short term, you should keep it in a money market account or a CD. However, if you have a reasonable period of time that you could grow it, you need to outpace inflation, which is one of the concerns we have right now. And the way that you do that is you get higher rates of return by going into the stock market. Now, one of the things that we see, which is very positive too, is uh, the gross domestic product is rebounding faster than it did after the Great Recession. We're seeing a huge surge. And I think part of it is because businesses are now kicking back in, they're hiring people. If you're looking at a restaurant, one of the biggest problems with restaurants right now is they can't get enough people to work for them. Um, and other businesses, the same thing is that they can't get enough employees to be able to provide the services that they want to provide. You also have a lot of uh, pent up demand, people wanting to go out to restaurants, wanting to go out to vacation, wanting to get on an airplane and visit their kids and grandkids. So you're seeing a huge spike in terms of, of money being spent within the, the US economy. And 70% of the US economy is driven by consumer spending. So the more that we have consumers spending money and with all the stimulus that's going out there, it's definitely creating a lot additional spending, then we can see how this kind of plays out. All right, Jeannie, why don't you get into some of the specifics of Biden's proposals and tax strategies? Sounds great, thanks, Jerry. So the Biden administration has proposed $4.1 trillion in spending programs, and it's really broken down into two plans. 
the slightly larger of the two is the infrastructure plan. And this is where proposing spending towards modernizing our transportation systems, upgrading the electric grid and developing clean energy resources, as well as looking at improving affordable housing options and investing in jobs for the future. Now, the second plan that uh, the Biden's put out, this is called the American Families Plan. And this really is kind of a two-parter where there's a trillion dollars in new spending, but there's also $800 billion put forth in tax credits. And really here, the focus is on education and supporting families. Now, these numbers are big. And just to put some kind of perspective around them, you know, if we look at this in terms of time, a million seconds, that equals 13 days. A billion seconds is 31 years. And a trillion seconds is 31,688 years. These things, these plans are enormous. So why do we even have these plans? Why is the Biden administration putting these ideas forth? You know, why are we doing this? Well, the shift in policy is really happening because you know, the majority of working Americans are not getting ahead at the same rate as our top earners. The rich are becoming richer and they're becoming richer at a faster rate than the rest of the population. So if we look at the top 1%, these are people who are earning more than $737,000 a year. We look over the past four years, you know, their incomes have grown by almost 158%. And the wealthiest of Americans, these are our uber wealthy people who are making more than $2.8 million a year. Their incomes grew by more than 340%. Now the bottom 90%, their income grew barely 24% during that same 40 year time frame. This gap, or really this chasm, has created a society that is more unequal than it has been in decades. And Biden's proposed spending programs are targeting education, families, jobs, all things to help raise these lower earners and help shrink the inequality gap. And the pandemic, you know, this past year in 2020 has really magnified this gap, especially because the low income earners, these were the people who are more disproportionately impacted by the effects of the pandemic. So we know that there's, you know, we've got these big plans, they have to be paid for. And tax planning and taxes are out there on the table and Biden has put a proposal out for how to help pay for his plans. You know, there are some proposed changes that we're aware of and we're gonna share with you now. Um, these are not set in stone. Everything still needs to work its way through Congress, but these are things that we think would be, that are really important for you to be aware of. The first of these is an increase in corporate tax rates. Right now, the tax rates are at 21%. This would be increasing them up to 28. An increase in the marginal tax rate, and this is the tax, this is the, dot, the, the tax rate that you pay on the next dollar that you earn, this would be increasing for top earners only. And people who make more than $400,000 a year, the rate would increase from 37 to 39.6%. Also for our high earners, again, this would be for people who are making more than a million dollars a year, the, their capital gains tax rate would grow from where it is today at 20%, effectively doubling it to 39.6. There would be a phase out of the small income um, small business income deduction for the, also those high earners making more than $400,000 a year, and then an elimination of the step up in basis. And now this one I think impacts more people, so I want to take a moment to kind of give you an explanation of what it means. So for example, mom bought a house a couple decades ago for $300,000. That $300,000 is her basis, what she paid for it. She dies and she, you inherit the house. The way it works today, the basis you inherit is the value of the date of when she died. So if it was worth 600,000 when she died, you now have 600,000, you go to sell it tomorrow for 600,000, you wouldn't owe any taxes on it. What Biden is proposing is that there would be no step up in basis. That what mom paid, that 300,000 she paid a couple decades ago, you inherit that. And if you go to sell the house and it's worth $600,000 today, you're gonna pay capital gains taxes on that difference. Now, there are two strategies that we haven't uh, really heard much about lately, um, but were in the original Biden tax plan. The first was be to limit itemized deductions and capping them at 28%, no matter your marginal tax bracket. 
And the second would be reducing the estate tax exemption from where it is today at 11.7 million per person down to 3.5 million. Now, with representatives in the House and Senate, you know, they're, we know they're really closely divided. And so getting any spending or tax proposals passed, you know, it's not going to be an easy feat. There's going to need to be compromise on both sides. And while Democrats and Republicans are really viewed as having very different beliefs, there are some shared common beliefs as well. If we look here at this, I'll we'll call it the green circle of support. This is where we have Republicans and Democrats where their views overlap. We see support here for infrastructure spending, for domestic manufacturing, and support for low to middle income workers. You know, and based on this circle, you know, we see that there's an opportunity to find some common ground within, Biden, within Biden's uh, proposed spending plans. So as an investor, kind of what can you do today? What's in your control? We know that the spending plans aren't in your control, the tax plans, you know, that's all gonna be you know, handled in, in Congress and the Senate. But, you know, what can you control? Well, there's certain things that you control. There are really three key things. The first is your risk appetite. And this is how much risk you can tolerate. You understand, has it changed from last year to where you are today um, or not? It's important to understand where you are. The second thing that you can control is your time horizon. And this is the amount of time that you earmark to reach your various goals. So think about if you have a 10 year plus time horizon, you have some different choices in terms of investing compared to if you have a short term time horizon of say less than two years. It's really important for you to match your goals and your time horizons. And then finally, your behavior. Again, this is, we want you to keep the big picture in mind and hopefully you'll kind of be able to like keep out any of the noise caused by short-term developments. Um, and that way, if you focus on your long-term goals, you know, we can help you manage any anxieties caused by short-term market noise or volatility. And we really want to emphasize here that the importance of keeping focused on what you can control versus what you can't. You know, you can't control the returns and you can't control market performance, but you can control your 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 risk appetite, your time horizon, and your behavior. So what happens, you know, what can happen if you don't keep that long-term focus? Well, your tolerance for risk may change and it may make you more conservative. There's a behavioral finance term called myopic loss aversion. And this is a common bias in which a greater sensitivity to losses um, than you would have towards gains. Essentially, a loss feels so much more painful than a gain brings you joy. There was research done by a couple of uh, Nobel Prize winning economists that found that you know, investors who review their portfolios very frequently, they tend to have shifts more towards conservative portfolios. Essentially, the more closely they monitored their portfolio, the greater likelihood they would see a loss and they would react to it by changing their investment strategy. Now, we know we have some really great technology here at JFL. We've got our JFL app, we've got the portal, um, where you can have access to how your accounts are doing 24 seven. But if you're someone who might react to some of the market volatility, you may be better off looking at these tools a little less frequently. Now, investment strategies work when they stay consistent over a long period of time. This is particularly true you know, with the stock markets. Now, you may not know that on average, the market goes down one out of every four months, one out of every four quarters, and one out of every four years. So you think about it on the flip side, it goes up three out of every four of those times. And you can, so in the long term, you know, we're gonna see the market go up, we're gonna see the markets go down, but over a long period of time, it will tend to increase. And on average, the market goes up eight to 10% per year. Now, another area that we're talking about slightly shifting here, talking about um, tax strategies. And this is an area where, again, this is someone that we can have control of or as investors. And the SECURE Act, you know, this was passed in late 2019, and it really changed how retirement accounts like IRAs or your 401ks are transferred to heirs. Now, before the SECURE Act, um, you know, if your parents were both alive, if, if mom died, the best practice was for the retirement money to go to dad. And then when dad died, it would go to the kids. Then the heirs would take the distributions over accounts that they inherited, they take them out over their lifetime. So their tax hit was kind of spread over a longer period of time. With the SECURE Act, 
the kids or the heirs needed to take their distributions out or need to take them out over 10 years. So if we look at the chart on the right there, we'll see that the lower green line is when dad is taking his distributions out, but then that jump in red, that's that 10 year period. So it takes a bigger tax hit. So a new best practice now, given the SECURE Act, is maybe looking at making sure, number one, that we have both primary and contingent beneficiaries on your retirement accounts. Then that way we could set up a strategy where instead of all the money going to dad when mom died, a portion of it goes to the kids today. And then that way it really helps smooth out the amount of money that's coming out of those accounts. And as a result, it kind of smooths out that tax hit. So what should you be doing today if you're a business owner? Well, Biden has been talking about raising the corporate tax rate up to 28% from 21%. He is not proposing to have that rate go all the way back up to 35%, which is where it was back before the tax cuts and job act that, um, went into play. We're not really sure at this point exactly what the loopholes or the tax code changes, what's going to pass. So we're still in a little bit of a wait and see mode at the moment until we know what is actually going to pass through Congress. And when we know more, we're gonna help you identify tax strategies that you can put in place before the law goes into effect and then also once it's in place. So here I just wanna kind of do a wrap up of that, just some of the key takeaways. That first off, you know, despite continued volatility, you know, the, the, the stock markets, they've really been starting off on a high note so far this year. And interest rates, you know, those are gonna stay low um, for the foreseeable future, for at least the next few years. And the economic recovery, you know, this really is still, things are starting to move and move in fits and starts. You know, as Jerry mentioned, uh, people can't wait to kind of get out there and travel again um, and start spending some of that money that's pent up. But a lot of this is really dependent on vaccine distribution and lower number of COVID cases. Things are recovering slowly. And um, I love this quote that I, that I found the other day. It's, we're finding it's easier to put economy into a coma than it is to wake it back up. So that things are things are improving, uh, but we still have a ways to go. And with a new administration, you know, Biden's coming in with new spending plans um, and then new tax uh, plans as well to help fund those those new proposals as well. And then finally, I want you to make sure again, reiterate that I want you to look at your time horizon and your risk tolerance and make sure that these are still aligned with your goals. And if they're not, then we need to kind of discuss and we can make adjustments to those. And then finally really stay focused on your goals and the long term. There are always going to be distractions out there and whether it comes from social media or in the news and it's really important to kind of be aware of those but also stay true to what you're what you're trying to do with your goals. Okay, thank you Jeannie and Jerry for that great report on uh, the first quarter economic results and an outlook for the rest of 2021. Uh, we hope that you received our most recent newsletter, which reinforces a lot about what we discussed today. Uh, and if there's anybody that you know of, uh, whether it's your own children or friends who might be interested in receiving it, please let us know and we'll add them to our distribution list. We'll also be back in the next coming months to address uh, some additional issues with webinars, including cryptocurrency, identity theft, and investing in real estate. Our cryptocurrency webinar is actually scheduled for June 8th, and we'll send out additional uh, details for you in the coming weeks. If you have any questions or would like to speak with Jerry or Jeannie about your personal financial situation, please contact us uh, at one of the inf uh, either via telephone or email. And thank you again for joining us today.